Well, let me welcome everybody today. This is the Phoenix Seventh Day Baptist Church. And, uh, you know, I thought of something this week, which is a little silly, really, but because we don't need to do that. You know how initials and everything is down to initials now, rather than saying the whole words like L O L and those kinds of things. And I thought of the name of our church in initials. You ready? P H X S D B. Phoenix Seventh Day Baptist. You like that? I don't. That one, I mean, I don't. I don't suppose it'll go into great use. But I just happened to think of it, so I thought I'd pass it along. The fact is, we are Phoenix Seventh Day Baptist Church, and for any who are are uh, joining us online, that'll be you know one of the things which you know a little bit later we will pray for is the election. That uh, you know we used to say. Election day is Tuesday, so let's pray. Well, now what that means is Tuesday is the final day of the election. It's been going on for weeks now, and many, many people have already voted, including me. Anybody who sees this next week will know how the elections came out. So uh, meanwhile, we who are here can still pray, and we're going to do that. And even next week, sometimes God answers even before we ask. So so we'll pray for our country. Anyway, we're here right now, we who are gathered, in order to worship the Lord. And so let's pray. Lord God, we we are grateful to you for this place to meet. We're grateful that you brought us safely here. We ask that you will uh, lead us, that you fill us with your spirit, enable us to give glory to you in all that we do and say, and uh, and even as we sing, that we sing for your praises. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture today is from First Timothy. You'll find that in your Bible just before 2 Timothy. And so it should be easy. 1 Timothy 1, starting in verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that to me first Christ Jesus might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him everlasting life. Oh, this is 17. I was thinking 16, but 17 is a good one because this is the praise that comes from that. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Earlier I mentioned the uh, election coming up, so let's be sure and pray for that. And, and uh, I'm assuming all of us, if we haven't, all of us who are qualified to vote, if we haven't yet, we will uh, on Tuesday. And so let's pray for the Lord to. You know, seeing the big picture, it's, what, one more election and after many elections before, and we trust there will be many elections after this. But uh, everyone is important. Let's pray for God to lead this process. Um, I want to ask, too, that our folks who are members of this church, we pray for our business meeting will be tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. And so uh, let's let's even start now praying for that. Um, oh, the, I I don't know. I apparently didn't 
affect us today, but just almost like announcement. I don't know what's going to happen this next week, but Rhonda sent me a little notice about uh, some asphalt that's going to be put on Sweetwater Street out here. Uh, now, according to the, the notice she sent, which was from the state or from the county, um, that it was supposed to start on the 16th, which is what, a week ago almost. I haven't seen anything out there yet, but uh, maybe by next week. I don't know what we'll find out there, but the main the main thing was that we not park on the street while they're doing this, so that shouldn't shouldn't affect what we're doing. But just in case we find something a little different uh, one of these weeks on the street, that's the reason why. Is there anything else we need to be praying about today? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, you have been so merciful to us. And as we come to you, we come only through the Lord Jesus. It was from your love and your compassion for people who have strayed away from you that you want to draw us back. And we're just so grateful for that. We ask that in our prayers and in our songs, in all that we do, even even in our fellowship together, we can honor you. Thank you, Lord, that, that we who gather here each week have, have this in common, that Jesus loves us. This we know. The, the, the Bible tells us so. And so we ask your blessing on us now as we, as we uh, pray for these needs. We pray for the election coming. We ask that, that you will have uh, a that that you have reasons to bless our nation. We pray for our leaders, both the present president and for the future president. We ask your blessing on this country as we move forward, and on your church as we serve you here. And uh, Lord, we ask you guidance for us as a church. We look ahead to the future. We pray that our meeting tomorrow will be a good step along the right directions. And so we're asking for you to give us wisdom and guidance. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Every so often, the question comes up, can you trust the Bible? Goodness, lots of critics there that say it was written only by people, not by God, if I can put it that way. Is the Bible really true? Should we believe everything it says? Many people are asking these questions, of, you know, or I should say maybe people are asking these questions about some other religions and their books. I don't really know, but I do know they're asking this about the Bible. Can we trust what the Bible says? Well, the short answer is yes, of course. The Bible was inspired by God and written by people who, who God chose. Now, one of those people was Paul, who mainly wrote letters to churches and other letters that he wrote to church leaders. You know, whenever Paul said scripture, he meant the books of the Old Testament. Then sometime later, Peter referred to Paul's letters as scripture. The first Christians were already seeing the Bible as God's word, Old Testament and New. Well, Paul did something once in a while in his writing. Uh, it's almost like he was anticipating the question, can we trust the Bible? And so there are several places in his writing where, where he called what he was about to say a faithful saying, or it can, it can be translated trustworthy saying. 
depending on your translation. Now, of course, everything else Paul wrote was scripture too. But in these places, he he started out with with uh, this is a faithful saying. I'd like to look at one of those today. There are actually five of these faithful sayings, and and they're they're all in the letters that are usually called pastoral letters, because Paul wrote these letters to Timothy and to Titus, who were church leaders in the places where they lived. And so they had to know God's word trustworthy. So earlier we heard 1 Timothy 1, 15, 16. First, a little background. Uh, most of the Jewish prophets had said that someone called Messiah was coming. Now they, you know, they weren't saying that his name would be Messiah. It was it was more like a title or a description. The word Messiah means anointed one, and the idea was that this person would be anointed or chosen by God to come and do great things for Israel. Even before the time of the prophets, there had already been predictions about this person who was coming as far back as Genesis. But the Jews really got interested in, in a Messiah during the time of the well, first the Roman Republic and, and then the Roman Empire, the Jews were allowed to live in, in that land, which is often called Palestine. They were allowed to live there, but it was occupied by Rome. It wasn't really what you call slavery, but it was hard. During those years, the Roman Caesar made decisions for Israel, not a Jewish king. And of course, the Jews always wanted to have their own king. So the people were hoping that Messiah would come and deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. You know, it's similar, it's almost the same idea as Moses coming to their ancestors to deliver them from slavery in Egypt many years earlier. If, if God had really given them the promised land, why shouldn't they be allowed to live there and to run things according to God's word? So the hope was there. The people had this very strong hope for this time to come. And they always kind of pinned their hopes on an, a Messiah who would come. Um, so every so often, someone appeared who, who looked like, uh, hey, maybe this is the Messiah. People would flock around him, and they, he would make some headlines for a while. Sooner or later, these Messiah types would usually cause a lot of trouble, eventually get themselves killed. Before very long, everybody forgot about them. Uh, there are actually a couple of examples of this in um, let's see, Acts chapter 5. Let's turn to that. Let's, let's look at that. Acts 5. Yeah, this is when, uh, you, you remember this story, some of the apostles had been arrested for preaching the gospel. And so they had to appear before the Jewish Sanhedrin, and the Jews told them to stop preaching about Jesus. And so 
while this went on, Gamaliel stood up and he spoke. This is Acts 5, verse 34. Uh, then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all those who, who obeyed him were scattered and, and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Okay, there's Thutis. Let's see, 400 followers. When he was killed, it all died out with him. Then it was Judas of Galilee. Same thing, same result. And these were just two. One of the really hard things for the Jewish people was, will the Messiah really come? And how will we know him if, if he does come? Then Jesus appeared. <laughs> now he more or less started out like the other messiahs. And what I mean by that is he, he was pretty spectacular for a time. He drew big crowds. He, he could heal people. He could drive out demons. He could feed thousands of people. He could walk on water. He could leap tall buildings with a single bound. Well, not that last one. But, you know, many people followed him. Eventually, they wanted to make him king. Now, at last, the Messiah has come, and the Romans will be thrown out of Israel. That's what they were hoping for. That's not what they got. Instead of the superstar military leader that everybody wanted, the faithful, trustworthy saying is that Messiah came into the world to save sinners. Actually, this is Christ here in First Timothy, but I, I hope you know that Christ and Messiah are, are the same word in different languages. He came into the world to save sinners. Yes, he was a miracle worker, healer, and exorcist, teacher of God's truth, all of these things that the real Messiah should be able to do. But it says here he came mainly to save sinners. Paul didn't make this up, of course. What he wrote here, Jesus had already said. The Son of Man came to seek and save was lost. We need to appreciate that word save as the Bible uses it. You know, for, for many people, uh, save means put money in the bank or in a retirement account and leave it there. Another thing it means is, you know, whenever I'm typing something on, on my laptop, every so often I, I type, Control S in order to save what I had typed. I was even taught once, whenever you're working with files on a computer, the good rule is save early and save often. Nowadays, of course, the word save is mainly used in advertising. 
use your use our credit card or sign up for our rewards program and save 10% on your next order. Or here's one I've heard, but I think is a ridiculous statement. The more you spend, the more you save. No, what Jesus came to do is to save us. And that means at least two things. To save from and to save for. To save us from sin and death and hell. And to save us for life and holiness and eternity with God. You remember that the angel told Joseph to name the child Jesus because the name means Savior, one who saves. Back in 1 Timothy, um, the next thing Paul wrote was to say that he himself was the chief of sinners or sometimes translated the worst of sinners that Jesus came to save. It would be easy to think that, you know, Paul was just, just being humble. He's just exaggerating to make a point. I'm not so sure. I think he meant it for two reasons. First, even, even after becoming a Christian, Paul never forgot that he had persecuted God's church, a direct sin against Jesus and his followers. And then, besides that, many Christians, not just Paul, but many Christians, have discovered that the closer you come to God, the more you become aware of how sinful you really are. Paul showed us the truth of, of what John Newton wrote. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. When Paul said he was the worst of sinners, it brings up a couple of questions that many people have asked. Are, are some sins worse than others? <laughs> are some sinners worse than others? The short answer is no and yes. Um, no, because all sin is bad in God's sight. I, I don't think I'm stretching it if I say that because God is absolutely holy, stealing a dime is as bad as stealing a million dollars. But it may be some sins are worse just by their very nature. I can think of some of an example or two, which maybe I won't share now, but only God can judge for sure. So maybe Paul really was the worst sinner, but God showed him mercy. This man who persecuted Christians, even had them killed was now an example of believing in Jesus and receiving eternal life, as, as he said in verse 16. If God can forgive Paul, he can forgive anyone. Now, I know that, that Jesus once talked about an unforgivable sin, which he said was the sin against the Holy Spirit. Um, goodness, we could spend the rest of the day on that if we wanted to, but i just say right now, I'm pretty sure this is not what Paul was talking about in 1 Timothy. His sin was forgivable, and ours is too. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Even the worst sinners, his teachings and his miracles were Terrific. They demonstrated to everyone who saw him who he is and to everyone who reads about it later. 
this is the main thing he came to do. No one is too sinful to be saved. There are no hopeless cases. This is good news. This is a faithful saying. Let's pray. Father, we really can't say it any better than God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, it's people sinning and you forgiving. Thank you for this good news. And thank you especially for our Savior Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.